Um, well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about some of the work that I'm doing uh, at SUTD in Singapore. So more specifically, I'll be talking about deep music generation, controllable deep music generation with a focus on emotion or effect. Now at our lab, Uh, at our lab in Singapore that I lead, uh, the audio, music, and AI lab, we do a number of projects and topics ranging from cough sound detection to effective computing, music generation, of course, audio transcription, and the like. So you might have heard of a recent project, a tool that came from our lab called NN Audio, which is basically um, a way to load spectrograms on the fly into a PyTorch network, making the spectrograms trainable during inference. Um, now, when I talk about music generation, I like to sort of start from the beginning. A lot of people think that AI music generation is something that really came about in the last few years. But if we look back, back to 1750s, we see that there's such a thing as musical dice games. Now you probably have heard of music dice games before, uh, and a lot of people attribute them actually to Mozart, but it was Kernberger who actually really invented them. Now, what is a musical dice game? Basically, the composer provides a sheet of music and each of the measures or bars is labeled with a number. Then you have some dice and you throw the dice and then based on the numbers you throw, the order of your piece or the resulting piece is determined. Basically, this is one of the first statistical models, chance-inspired models for music generation. Of course, um, the when we look at computer-generated music, uh, it, we have to skip another 100 years to the invention of the first programmable computer, or perhaps I should say calculator back then the difference engine or the analytical engine from Charles Babbage, which was a steam powdered, steam powered uh, programmable computer using punch cards. Now Ada Lovelace, who some of you might know, is considered to be the world's first programmer. She was the one that wrote the notes or the first programming notes for this engine. And in her notes, we find the following quote, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So way back then, the idea of that, hey, we might use computers, even in that form, to generate music was already born. Of course, they didn't actually compose a piece of music. For that, we need to skip another 100 years, and we find the Iliac Suite, which is often considered to be the world's first computer generated music. This was composed or programmed by Hiller and Isaacson on the Iliac computer, which was at Pennsylvania University. Now this is a sort of mainframe computer that fills up an entire room and that you programmed program by connecting patch cables from one module to another. The Iliac suite was a string quartet. Uh, you can listen to it on YouTube. It is, sounds pretty avant-garde, but it's not so bad, you know, uh, given the way that the, the tools that they had to work with. It was based on some markup models and some rules. Now, the next few years, um, especially say the last 30, 30 years, there's been a lot of papers come out, um, some using rule-based models, some exploring with metaheuristics, genetic algorithms in the 90s, um, simple neural networks, factor oracles, a bunch of things. But it didn't really produce, you know, a finalized musical piece. So, and then the last few years, we've seen something very interesting with the emergence of deep neural networks. Um, and if you listen to Ed's talk recently, we see that we have over 20 plus uh, companies offering AI-based music uh, to consumers. So this is very interesting. And it does beg the question a little bit, are we done then? Okay. 
And I find that every year this question is a bit harder to answer because there are very, very cool and useful products that are being released uh, as we speak. Now, my personal opinion on this always has been that there are still a few elements that are difficult to achieve uh, when you just train a deep learning AI model. And one of them is the long-term structure. It's fine to generate something that sounds good for a few seconds, but something that really sticks in your head, uh, like an earworm, a theme that you're humming afterwards is very hard to achieve because really optimizing melodies that resonate is very hard. A lot of the systems out there produce ambient music, background music, and sort of the foreground melody that's supposed to stick in your head is, is still a bit of a challenge. Finally, there's also emotion, because as you know, music and emotion are intrinsically connected. Uh, when I was a teenager, had a bad breakup, I listened to music to cheer me up. It, uh, people listen to music to alter their emotional states and computers and emotions, it's not so much of an intrinsic relationship because it's hard for computers to understand emotion. And throughout, let's say the last seven years, uh, I sort of on these two aspects and I want to guide you through the the, the voyage that I took starting uh, with a Morpheus system that I created while I was a Marie Curie fellow at Queen Mary the Center for Digital Music uh, about seven years ago. So I was working with Prof Elaine Chu and we decided to focus on these two things. Uh, we modeled emotion long-term structure, and we used an optimization approach, not so much a machine learning approach at this uh, moment. Let me go over each of these points. For modeling emotion, we chose to focus on tonal tension um, to represent, let's say, a component of emotion. Now, we created the model to capture three aspects of tonal tension. And this model was based on Elaine Chu's spiral array which is a 3D mathematical model of tonality. The array consists of three helixes and one for pitch, chords, and keys. You see the pitch helix depicted there, which is the one we worked with. Each of the pitches have uh, a specific location, perfect fifths or next to each other, major thirds or above each other. And it allows us to really actually provides us with a clever embedding of pitch representations. So the three measures we looked at, uh, first one is cloud diameter. Now a cloud is uh, all of the notes that sound at the same time. Uh, the blue ones here are majors, a C major chord. And the diameter, how far stretch out this chord is, tells us something about the tonal coherence of the chord. Then we have cloud momentum, which is basically the movement of the center of all these clouds uh, as we go along in the piece. And finally, there's stencil strain, which is the distance of your cloud or your chord to the actual key. That will tell us something over about the overall dissonance compared to uh, the piece. Now, this tonal tension uh, model was implemented in Java and meanwhile also in Python. So if you're interested, uh, that is available online. Here's an example of um, these three tension measures, the three colors you see in the figure that are calculated for a famous tense chord called the Tristan chord. Tristan is a bit of a funny chord, which has an augmented fourth, sixth, and ninth, and it originates from Wigner's opera Tristan and his Aldrids. It gets played each time the Tristan character enters a stage and to denote a certain tension that comes along with this character. When we display the chord in the array, you immediately see that it's all stretched out. So our cloud diameter will be really big. Um, in the example, you see that it occurs on the first beat of the third measure. So you see that basically all of the metrics show a peak, except the last one, the, the Tensile strain or the distance from the key is high everywhere because this fragment is, is, is quite chromatic. Um, all right, let's have a listen.
right? So you can hear how the things get more tense in that third bar. So great, now we have a way to capture emotion, or at least in the form of tension. Then we used a pattern detection algorithm, um, which I, I really enjoy using this from Prof. David Meredith in Alberg, uh, called Kosciatek or Saya. And it's basically sort of like a zip compression algorithm. It finds repeated patterns, but the cool thing is these patterns can be transposed. So here in the Bach example, um, we see the lines. You see the green line indicates how there is a descending line, melody line, uh, both in the base of the first bar and the top track of the um, second bar. The red uh, pattern also shows a repeated pattern, but transposed in the first, sorry, first track, first bar, and second bar, second track. Let's listen to this. So uh, to understand the graph, we have time on the x-axis and pitch height on the uh, y-axis. So this is a fantastic tool, and we use it later on as well to evaluate deep learning models based on the compression ratio that's given by this uh, algorithm, which basically represents the amount of re repetitions in a piece. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we have everything ready. So how Morpheus, what Morpheus did is we started from a template piece we detected the patterns and will hard constrain our generated piece to these patterns. That means the patterns content can still change, but whenever there's a repeated piece, we need to repeat um, whatever we decide to put in that pattern. And then we're going to optimize using combinatorial optimization, um, the tension of the generated piece so that it matches uh, the template or any user given tension. All right, there's an example. Uh, I'm sorry, some of you might have heard it, if, if, but I, I like showing it because uh, it's, it's an interesting example. If you want to hear some other examples, you just go to the QR code. Uh, Elaine, Prof. Elaine Chu has actually performed quite uh, a few of these pieces and some are very interesting as well. Here we started from a very uh, recognizable or piece. Some, everyone I'm sure will be familiar with this. Right. So the first step that we do is we, we randomize the pitches, but we make sure that the patterns and the rhythm stays the same. So at first, it's going to sound pretty terrible. OK, you get the point. So then we run our optimization algorithm, and we only optimize the tension. So this is quite interesting. We can reach pretty good results only optimizing the tension. We did not look at statistical likelihood of intervals and all that. So this would be the result. And this particular example uh, is interesting because we're also familiar with this piece that some of these parts due to the patterns that are so plentiful in this piece, we, we will see that the generated music violates your expectations in an, a fun kind of way. Right. Um, so that's that's great, and we've done a lot of uh, fun performances with with this uh, tool. But when I started here at SUTD, I I wanted to break beyond the limits of Morpheus because Morpheus is fine, but you always start from a template piece, and it's not really pop music, although you could apply it to that. Um, so we wanted to focus on controllable deep music generations, and can we learn any style? without using this template? Mm -hmm. And can we control the generation in terms of emotion and also other musical attributes? And then finally, of course, always a long-term structure. Can we bring in these earworms? 
So the first project I want to briefly talk about is disentangling tension. So in this project, which was performed by an intern in my lab, PG Sunreko, uh, who's at the University of Sussex, uh, he developed, we developed a variational autoencoder, and we stuck here with the same tension models that we've been using before. Now, variational autoencoders really learn to reconstruct music. Uh, but in this case, we did not just let them reconstruct music. We also let them predict the tension uh, metric. So we chose to use two tension metrics here. And the interesting part is that because it learns how to predict these tension metrics, we see that, in fact, the latent space from which we sample contains these properties. And then we learned a model that can perform transformations in this latent space so that we can change the tension included in a certain piece generated or seeded to this algorithm. Um, this model was trained using a melody and a baseline from the data set and Ray, uh, implemented the tension library in a, a Python library called MIDI minor, so you can use it. <clears throat> and the result sounds something like this. Okay, so this is an original piece generated by the algorithm. All right. So this is the tension here is represented in the red line on the on the on the graph. So what we then did is we did some latent transformations to get the tension a bit higher. Now the result is subtle, but this is the transformed piece. So it still goes down a bit. The tension goes down a bit in the end, but in the beginning, it does sound a little bit more tense. Now we did the opposite. We made it less tense, and it sounds like this. Well, a bit more cheerful. Um, so, from this, we moved on and we thought it was a very interesting idea to use variational autoencoders, but we wanted to break free from always using the tension. So we looked at real valence and arousal features. Now, the problem that we always face with valence and arousals is that there are very few data sets available. Right? There's Fiji MIDI that came out a few years ago, but it's not always appropriate. So the idea that we came up with is to use some sort of semi-supervised learning to leverage upon other data sets that we do have available. We also figured that a lot of these arousal, valence properties, emotional properties are actually controllable by lower level features like rhythmic density and note density and others. So we wanted to test the concept. Can we learn these lower level features and then once we can control music using lower level features, can we learn presets of these faders like for high arousal, for low arousal? So the way we did this was with a Gaussian mixture autoencoder, Gaussian mixture variational autoencoder. And <clears throat> here we have three modules. So we have the typical reconstruction model, the yellow one. We learn to reconstruct a piece. Then we have a discriminator, discriminator model which learned to predict the low level features like rhythmic density, note density, it can be anything. But, and that one we train using, we only need a MIDI data set, right? Because we can actually infer these uh, and label these low level features ourselves. So we have pretty much a lot of data. Then the third and most interesting uh, piece here is the purple one, the cluster inference module. Now this one we train with semi-supervised learning. Here we learn to predict the higher level attributes, so the presets. In this case, we tested it with arousal. And for arousal, we only have a little bit of data available. So we used the VG MIDI uh, data set here to sort of fine tune that part of the network. 
So the good thing is if we look at the latent variables, we see that there is a nice separation both between the low level features as well as the high level arousal cluster, which is on the right of this image. So <clears throat> I'll, let me show you an example of the output here. Sorry, this one isn't rendered so nicely. So this is a first an original piece. transform this piece into something that's high arousal, so high energy. So it still sounds pretty much the same, but sort of the velocities and the, the, the repetitions are augmented. All right, so this is promising, but we didn't really tackle the long-term structure. So for that, we wanted to look at some of the networks that are known to be pretty good for this, uh, the transformer networks, but we wanted to make them controllable. So we found our inspiration uh, in the neural machine translation task. We wanted to take a bunch of control features, valence of quartz, but not just valence, also time signature, grouping indications, density of events, and to give the model only the conditions and then translate these into lead sheets, lead sheets being melody and uh, chords. And we train the model using the Wikifonia dataset. But as always, uh, how do we get valence of our dataset? And we, if, and that, Dr. Dimos, who was my postdoc at the time, uh, together with him, we devised a quite interesting method for deriving valence and arousal values from chords. So we found, we, we took a deep dive into sort of music cognition, music psychology literature, and we found that Chase in 2006 created this list of chord modes uh, together with their associated emotions. Mm -hmm. Then we looked at a paper from Shearer in 2005, and he had mapped uh, they had mapped these terms, emotion terms, to the valence and arousal space. So we merged these two models together. We took our chords, we got the emotion tags, then we put the emotion tags on the valence arousal space. So this method allowed us to get sort of a circumvented way to get the valence and arousal tags. For the rest, we took a standard neural machine learning translation approach. And we had two dictionaries, one for the encoder input, which consists of the conditions. So we have 444 four, four, four time signature, grouping, start of a sentence or not, um, <clears throat> low valence, and medium density here, for instance. Then the decoder sequence is the actual lead sheet, which consists of pitch height, duration, and chord. So that we tested with a number of sequence to sequence architectures, including LSTM and transformer. It seemed that the transformer performed best. Um, when we did listening tests, we noticed that transformer ratings slightly outperformed the human composer from the data set ratings uh, on, on the melody and chords. Uh, not so much on the naturalness, but still the results were pretty encouraging. What's more, if we asked the raters to rate the emotion that they perceived in the generated fragments, it always, pretty much always course, correlated with the intended condition that was given to the, the model. So let's listen to one output of a transformer model. Okay, so that's that's great progress. And one last thing that I want to talk about is um, when we we're discussing to create these transformer models, it actually to us made sense to look at music on different levels. So we did some experiments and we created a hierarchical RNN system, which was basically inspired by sample RNN. And we looked at the 
train training music, the input music on three levels. So we had the, the note level, the bar level, and the sentence level. So this is an interesting architecture. Uh, and this one was used to generate a melody on top of input chords. We found that it's very good at dealing with meter and it can really uh, perform quite well in terms of compression ratio. I mentioned before that we sometimes use the Kosciatek pattern detection algorithm in evaluation, uh, which is what we did here because the work was so focused on structure. Uh, the compression ratio for the generated music was really high, meaning that they contain a lot of repeated patterns. So we trained models on different genres, electronic, jazz, pop, and, and I'll just show you an electronic and generated piece. Now, right. So this is all really interesting. Uh, but one of the projects that we're focusing now is music, emotion, and video. How are these related, and can we really generate music that matches video? So. As you notice throughout this talk, we have struggled with how to represent emotion. Uh, we, we created this method for deriving valence, uh, or we use tonal tension. But that's what one of the first things here that we did is we created a set of three data sets, which this paper is very close to being published. Uh, and this data set consists of music videos, basically together with annotated uh, valence and arousal, and we have created both matched pairs and mismatched pairs. It was quite uh, difficult to create mismatched pairs. We've done it inspired by emotion. So we used both some data sets that had labeled emotion, or sometimes we used attend the fact net, which is a model we previously created for multimodal emotion detection. And, and based on this, uh, we are releasing three data sets, which have um, all of these features together with a baseline model to predict a bench, benchmark model really to predict if music matches or corresponds with video or not. We've tested this for match detection as well as music retrieval for video, and it seems to work pretty well. What we're doing now in the next steps is we're trying to use this to generate matching music to video. Now, of course, this is an audio data set. So one of the things that we're doing is we're doing multi-instrument multi transcription first from the data set so that we can create a sheet music or a MIDI representation first with all this. So I'm, I'm quite excited. Um, about this project and, and really hope that this will create a really practical application. So in sum, I really say that the future of music generation is here, but some of these deep generative models really still lack some emphasis on melody, some earworms, some controllability, and some structure. And it is my the question I ask myself very often is, what can we do to bring generated music to people's lives in a meaningful way? So if you're interested in working on this, uh, do contact me as I might have some upcoming job opportunities as well. Really hope you enjoyed this talk and I'd be very happy to answer any questions.